Hey, IDS 302. Welcome to module four, video one. It is Sunday, January 31st at about 1220. I think uh, Tottenham and Brighton Hove Albion are just starting here. I'm going to slow this down a little bit. I thought they started at 1230. Okay, anyways, um, let's take a look on what's going on in 302. Um, general stuff, uh, you know, now that these papers are coming up, step one, two, three, four, five, I encourage you strongly to not be a due date writer, to not be, I'm going to start, I know this paper is due on Sunday, so I'm going to start Sunday morning bright and early, and I'm going to get this paper in by midnight. If you do that, you're not going to be successful in this class. I'm just advising you. This, these papers require academic rigor. You can't do academic rigor in a day unless you're lucky. Typically, you need to review things, reread things, look for things. You need to dig out things. You need to spend time looking for the materials that you need, the sources. Um, so I recommend getting started a lot sooner, understanding kind of the basic philosophy of what the paper is going to be about and then starting maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday with some kind of outline in your head that you can conceptualize it. And then looking for some of the sources that you're going to need to back up your work and then putting together a rough draft and then letting that sit overnight and, and, and simmer, which is what good writers do, and then pull it back out, look at it with fresh eyes. So that you double check, rewrite, double check formatting and get it submitted. You don't have a lot to do in this course except to write these papers. And as much as saying write these papers is very ominous to college students, it's not that bad. It really isn't. You got it. I've seen your writing. You can do it. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid of it. Don't be intimidated. Um, okay, so module four. Uh, am I doing? I'll do Easter egg number one right away. Do the readings. Easter egg one is do the readings. Um, I'm going to discuss a lot of them in, 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 in video 4.2, but the readings are Chan Tanner Chapter 6 on basic research methods. That is 13 pages approximately. Then Chapter 7, Introduction to Interdisciplinary Research, is approximately 10 pages. And then Tanner Chapter 8 is Methods of Integration is approximately 15 pages. So what you got there is 15, 25, 38 pages of easy reading. I'll probably read it today again. Okay. Um, Get that going. Um, then you get to do, you get to watch a video, my video, okay? Uh, it's not about me, but I made this video. It's about 33 minutes long, oh, 35 minutes long. Um, it's called Hal Brown, The Incomplete Stories of an Irregular Guy. Hal is, was, is a friend of mine who I met in Ahwatukee, Phoenix, Arizona, when I was selling my my artwork and my stuff at markets, and it was one here in Ahwatukee, and he was setting up his booth a couple away from mine one morning, and he was playing this, uh, you know, loud boombox music from the 60s and 70s, and he had a real long white beard and cowboy hat and all this jewelry and silver on him, and, you know, it was, uh, we struck up a conversation and became fast friends. And it, that day he gave me like 90 CDs uh, back when you could do that. So I could load them into my computer and put them on my uh, phone and that, which iPod, which I did. Um, Hal is a silver artist, a jeweler. Um, he's, he's a craftsman. And um, Hal's also a member of the Hell's Angels. Hal is also a um, a character. He has sort. If you've seen the movie Forrest Gump, he kind of went through seven, his first seventy years of life and encountered and experienced history in a way that um, I've always was interested in. I used to go over to his house. We'd sit outside, have a sit by the pool, have a cigar, and do some shots and. Um, He'd get high, 72 years old, I think, 71 he was. And uh, we talked stories and stories. It was the late 60s. And I was just like, hell, man, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta do a movie about you someday. He's like, yep, or we got to write a book. So, well, that sat in the background for years until my master's degree, and I needed to do a capstone project. And 
I had a really good idea that I prepared for for quite a few months on refugee resettlement. I wanted to do a video. I wanted to step out of my comfort zone of photography, painting, graphite, acrylics, you name it, and get into video production. Uh, bought a lot of equipment, low end, but I had a lot of equipment. I said, I want to do this myself. I, could, I, I didn't get permission from the professor I had at grad school. I went over his head to the grad school director and showed her in the print of the uh, the requirements was a research paper or creative project. She said, yep, go ahead and do it. So I had my two advisors. Um, one was uh, like a history professor and one was a uh, master's of fine arts. Uh, she knew about the product production values of, of performance and things like that. And then I had some classes in video editing and video production. And I went and I just dove into this thing I had my digital single lens reflex, DSLR camera, Nikon with a shotgun mic. And I used that with Hal. Well, anyways, I had this project with the refugee thing and it, it blew up my face in February. Okay. And I had to get this thing done by April. Um, so I had to throw it all out. I gave Hal a call. I, I never forget. I was going to stop. I said, Hal, you're up to bat, buddy. He came over to my apartment. We sat upstairs. Some of the video you see were my waste bag is hanging on the wall. That was just crapshoot video. I had set that up just to get an idea what he wanted to talk about, what we were going to do before I wrote up kind of a synopsis, a treatment for it. And he ended up uh, ended up using a lot of it. I mean, the sound quality isn't the greatest, but trust me, it ain't the worst either. Um, the editing, I, I used Premiere Pro for the first time. I used three different cameras. I had the, the DSLR with the shotgun mic. You'll notice I had a like a... Um, old uh, iPhone in front of Hal where I was getting sound. I also had an iPhone on my selfie stick that I extended and I used as a kind of an overhead camera that I could move around. And so it was just me doing that. And then I had to put all this sound together, edit everything. And, and then we went over to the guitar center. So Hal could grab a guitar and we went in a sealed room and he, he played his own soundtrack. Um, and, uh, I liked how it came out and Hal loved it. I call him my big brother because I don't have one. Um, he lives in Maui now. He moved back to Maui a few years ago. He texts me every night. Well, not every night, but a lot of nights he'll text me. And it's always like, you know, it's so early in Hawaii from here. And I'm in bed like 830. So it's like I wake up in the morning. Hey, bro, what's going on? <laughs> it's like Hal, you know. So, but please, that's a good movie. I'd like you to watch that. But I'd like you to think about then. In terms of you have to do an analysis on this academically on disciplines. You just went through like thinking outside the box and a whole page of different disciplines. Think about the disciplines that you could use that you identify from this from this video. Think about them. I have a list, some that I look for that I think are are tricky but obvious. And I like to see who's on the ball with this. So think about this write down the disciplines that you can see as you go through this video, okay? Um, because I think it is um, it is representative of some of the things I need to do for a Master's of Interdisciplinary Studies, right? Okay, so do that. Um, then uh, Easter egg number two, academic rigor. I want to remind you about academic rigor because um, in these papers that are coming, these aren't just, I'm going to write what I know and turn it in you're not going to pass the class. I can be that definitive. You need to show academic rigor. You need to um, have sources that back up your, your work, peer-reviewed sources, okay? You have, to, um, you have to dig on this. You have to step up your game. Remember, you cannot include yourself. There is no I, me, my. I don't want to hear about I mean, I had a student that used his grandmother as a source. Not cool. Okay. That was in one of my face-to-face -face classes. We had a good chuckle about it, though. It's like, use your grandma, dude. <laughs> so I want you not to use videos as sources. No YouTube. Um, you can use a good pay newspaper like New York Times, LA Times, Cron.com, but only at a five-to-one ratio where five of yours or the five are peer-reviewed research from academic journals, and the one is a newspaper, okay? 
We're not relying on these things. If you have problems with that, be sure to let me know. And this should be done on every paper, some more than others, of course. But every paper should have, because if it doesn't, it means you're just writing on your own. It's like an editorial. You're not writing academically with rigor. You're not showing that when you say when you say that climate change is a is 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 a, is a, is a huge problem we face today. Well, who said that? Jane Doe, you, the writer. Who's who, who's backing you up on that? Okay, the World Health Organization in 2020 said that the COVID. In 2019, the COVID would risk to be involved. See, you're using something to back it up. And guess what? When you use it, you cite it. You cite where you got that information from. Author year, right? And then at the bottom, you have a bibliography, a reference list that you set up in hanging paragraphs. Okay, now let's see how you do. Okay, I'm not making any promise or anything, but you know, there's a, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult first paper, but once you get it and understand what I'm looking for, because what I'm looking for is legit. Wow. Wrong team score. Uh, once you understand, you'll be flying through this, but academic rigor is key. This isn't something that I got to write about myself on Sunday. You're not writing about yourself. You don't get to appear. Okay. So let's take a look at, you're going to, you have step one due today. Step two is to justify an interdisciplinary approach. What meaningful questions can you ask about the issue problem? How are these questions interdisciplinary? What makes them meaningful? I'd like you to review that. Of course, all this, what you what you are going to do and how you're going to address your topic on this, then you're going to use an interdisciplinary. The, the sections are interdisciplinary justification, assumptions of the study, limitations of the study. I will talk more about those on Wednesday's video 4.2. I have a lot of details in here on formatting and things like that. Please follow that. Okay. But right now, let me take, we did Easter egg too, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me take this time to, again, talk to you about this overarching research topic that you chose and where you're going with it, where you should go with it. Again, I want you to think about it in terms of that question. What are some of the opinions, perceptions, and experiences regarding blank? comma, revealed in a survey of random adults, question mark. You're filling in that blank. Now, if you had a, if you have a big, broad topic, you know, how do you, how do you drill that down to make it work for this pro project? I get it. Because you can't say, I'm going to, I'm going to do research on COVID. What are you going to do on COVID? You're going to cure it? Well, what are you going to do? So, yes, I agree with you. So that's the start. So whatever you have in that general topic, let's kind of leapfrog and think about the data collection. When you're doing research and having to acquire data, you have to have some idea about where that data is going to come from. Okay, If you're doing research on the Titanic, are you going to go down in a submarine and gather pieces and relics and get your data from that? Or are you going to look at data from oral histories and paint this entire pick different picture. So you have to know kind of generally where you get your data from. If you're getting your data from a quantitative survey of random adults. That means every random adult, 18 and over, gets to take your survey anonymously and they all have the same choices of questions and answers. Everything's the same. Okay. So you think to that. Now you think, okay, I'm gonna do it on COVID. Uh so now you know you're not going to be what are some of the opinions, perceptions, experiences regarding um, vaccine efficacy for COVID revealed in a survey of random adults. No, you're not going to do that. But you might say, what are some of the opinions, perceptions, and experiences regarding uh, everyday life during a pandemic, during this pandemic revealed in a survey of random adults? So you're going to do about COVID, but you're, going to, you're looking at it from a standpoint, you know, of how's it affecting people? Okay. Or you're going to say um, regarding uh, direct, uh, regarding the, the, the effects of COVID in everyday life, something like that. You do it for random adults, something that you could ask random adults questions about, right? Have they had COVID? How do they know anybody that's COVID? And we'll get into, I'm not, I'm giving you a random question. There should not be, 
by the way, there are no yes or no questions for your surveys. There are none. There should be zero yes or no questions. And I'll probably make that an Easter egg real soon. Any yes or no question you have should be a question of intensity, okay? So yes might be over here and no might be over here, but you do have this gradation in there because you know how that is, one to five, right? It's not yes or no. It's, you know, it's not like, do you like my car? It's like, how much do you like my car? One, you hate it. Five, it's the greatest thing ever, right? It's not, do you like it, yes or no? So we stay away from those binary choices that do not reveal much in terms of data. We'll get into that later, okay? In the meantime, though, I want you to think back to, I said, to the data collection and then look at your topic again and say, what, what area of this topic can I use, work on, and can I direct my research to that will allow for questions to random adults, okay? Um, and, the, and that should give you a lot of your answers. Again, I've spoken to three to four students from a class on the phone. I believe our conversations have been quite productive in terms of where they wanted to go with their research. And I'm giving you that same opportunity. If you want to set up a call with me, you do that sooner than better, obviously. I don't want anybody painting themselves into a corner here, you know, so be sure that you're good to go on where you're taking this. Okay. Um, and again, formatting is going to be very important. Well, let's see. I think my, my 301 video was like 26 minutes and yours is going to be like 16, 17 minutes. Good for you. Um, so I think that's it for now. Like I said, I'm going to talk more about the readings and step two uh, in the next video, which I should get out Wednesday. In the meantime, I want to just go over that stuff generally, what to expect from you on these. And as always, send me emails on questions, comments, concerns. As we're speaking here, I've got a few already, a couple from my 301 that are not pleasant, I can tell. Okay, so uh, you guys have a great Sunday. Enjoy your uh, week wherever you are. Forks up. Peace.